in my restless dreams, I see that town. Silent Hill. You promised you'd take me there again someday, but you never did. Well, I'm alone there now, in our special place, waiting for you. The year was 1996, and the world of video games was undergoing a massive change. The advent of 3D gaming. Resident Evil was released that March to critical acclaim. Final Fantasy VII would follow in January the next year. Times were changing. The success of Resident Evil proved horror games were a solid bet. Of course, it wasn't the first of its kind. Four years earlier, Alone in the Dark met with similar success, and was the first game to use 3D polygonal characters over 2D sets. Before that was Otori Giso, a sound novel for the Super Famicom in Japan. And a few years earlier, in 1989, there was Sweet Home, a Metroidvania for the family computer credited as the first survival horror game. Each title took steps forward towards horror that the next game would follow. Atori Giso and Sweet Home never made it outside Japan, but Alone in the Dark was met with worldwide acclaim, and Resident Evil saw even greater success. It was around this time, during this great overhaul in game development, that Konami decided they wanted part of this success. Specifically, they wanted a 3D horror title. The problem was, with 3D being so new, the industry professionals were still learning it. Many of the older and experienced staff of Konami had no idea how to use the technology. It would be the new generation, just coming into the field, who would have to steer this ship. Konami often looked to college campuses for its new professionals, and this was no different. Tama Art University was one such school. Also known as Tamabi, it's one of the top art schools in Japan, and it was here that Konami found not one, but two of the most influential creators of the Silent Hill series. Takayoshi Sato was studying fine arts when Konami came to the campus looking for 3D artists. His background was in oil painting and sculpture. It took three art tests and five interviews with Konami for him to finally get the job in 1996. For his first year, he was on the team that ported Sexy Parodius to the Sega Saturn and PlayStation. He was the team's sole artist. It was hell, according to Sato-san, where a work week consisted of 15-hour days, seven days a week. But like many in the industry, Sato-san could feel the change in the air. The era of 2D gaming was ending. If he didn't continue developing his skills, he'd be left behind. So, he began learning how to do 3D animation by himself after he'd finished his other work. In September of 96, he was brought on to the Silent Hill team. The other student to come to Konami from Tamabi was Masahiro Ito. He graduated from Tamabi with a degree in graphic design, and even won an award for his work. He would join Konami in 97, as an artist working on both background and monster design. Another college student to go straight to Konami was none other than Akira Yamaoka, the musician behind the haunting tracks of the original games, 
now perhaps the most famously known member of the team. But he didn't start out studying music. In fact, he never learned how to read sheet music or studied any musical theory. In high school, he was part of a punk rock band, but didn't enjoy having to collaborate with a team. In college, he studied product and interior design, and while working on 3D modeling, discovered his computer had a free music software. He began experimenting and sent his works into contests as a hobby, and he won. That's when he was approached to be a musician for video games. He left college without graduating and joined Konami in 93, and went on to work on multiple projects until the time came to choose who would make the music for Silent Hill. Yamaoka-san put himself forward. It was his belief he was the only one who could do the project justice. Another artist to join the team was Masashi Tsuboyama. He joined Konami in 95 and began his career there as an artist working on the game Twin B RPG. For Silent Hill, he would work on background design. Working alongside him was Isao Takahashi, another background designer. His career began in TV, not gaming, and Silent Hill would be his first title. There was Naoko Sato, a young woman who in elementary school wrote a novel with her friends about a man's murder. In her older years, it was Biohazard, the Japanese title for Resident Evil, that cemented her love of horror. She started at Konami as an artist working on Vandal Hearts in 96. When the time came to put together Silent Hill's team, she was brought on as a monster designer. The first nurses to ever exist in the series were designed by her. Akihiro Imamura was also brought in. He'd been at Konami since 92, working on International Track and Field, the 3D update of the Track and Field series that released in 96. He came onto the team as a programmer, working on the overall game system. But who would be the head of this team that was coming together? Who would direct the 3D horror game Konami wanted? That man was Keiichiro Toyama. He too began to consider working in games during college, though it was a representative from Sega who held the seminar at his school. He was studying art and design, and received multiple offers, but chose Konami. They brought him on as a graphic designer, and his early work included Snatcher and International Track and Field. It was just as his training period as a new hire was ending that Silent Hill was beginning, and Toyama-san was approached to be the director. He accepted, and would go on to direct one of the most influential horror games to ever exist. He was only 26 years old. This was the team that would craft the masterpiece that redefined a genre. A main team of less than 20 people, working for three years. For most of them, it was their first major project. They were young, untried, and untested. And they were about to show the world just what they could do. Konami gave Toyama the prompt, a 3D horror game. It was up to him to decide what that would be. He wasn't actually much of a horror buff himself at the time, so he decided to look elsewhere for inspiration. What struck him most was a novel by Western horror master Stephen King, The Mist. Published in 1980, The Mist is the story of a small American town that is suddenly overwhelmed by a strange, otherworldly fog. Out of this fog comes horrific monsters that terrify the townsfolk. Toyama loved it, and wanted to make an actual adaptation of the book into a game 
but copyright law kept that from happening. Undeterred, the team was still enraptured by this idea of a horrific fog, of being unable to see the terrors coming at you. So began the process of developing their own haunted American small town. It would be 3D, like most modern games, but the team took a step forward. Resident Evil and Alone in the Dark both had 3D models for their characters, but they were overlaid on static 2D backgrounds. This was less expensive and less technically challenging than trying to render everything in 3D. But for their fog concept, the team needed an environment that had depth, a sense of scale. They made the choice to render everything with 3D models. It was a challenge. The PlayStation was limited in what it could do, and not everything turned out picture perfect. But the fog became their saving grace. Overlaid on top of their models, the fog and darkness could hide imperfections and lower the distance that had to be rendered for the player to see. The concept was coming together. But there was a problem. For their 3D game, they needed 3D cutscenes, and most members of the team didn't know how to create them. Enter Takayoshi Sato. Having taught himself how to perform such tasks, he found himself being asked by older team members how to perform the work. He would show them, but never received any credit for his contributions. As a younger team member and a new hire, he was restricted to little projects like typesetting. But that wasn't enough. So, Sato-san came up with a plan. He developed a demo, brought it to his superiors at Konami, and gave them an ultimatum. Give him 3D work on a big project like Silent Hill or Metal Gear, or he would keep his talent and knowledge to himself. They agreed. This was how he was given the role of developing the 3D cutscenes for Silent Hill. But he would be the only team member to work on them. It took him nearly 2,000 hours to render all of it by himself. For three years, he worked incredibly long hours, slept under his desk, and rarely went home. Part of what made it so much work was Sato-san's own dedication to rendering the facial animations himself. The team used motion capture to create the physical movements of characters, but Sato-san chose to animate the faces by hand. A decision he says is based on the technical limitations of mocap. Subtlety and emotion can't quite be conveyed without a human touch. And in watching his work, you can tell Sato-san is right. The human emotion of Silent Hill, the heart of the game, is in part reinforced by his truly fantastic work on the cutscenes. Another change happening in the game industry in the late 90s was the introduction of voice acting to video games. It wasn't fantastic. But something's wrong with this house. The voices in Resident Evil were infamous for their cheesy, overly dramatic, and downright strange uses of English. That wasn't what Team Silent wanted for their game. They aimed at creating a truly horrific title, and wanted the script and voice work to reflect that. It was to Harry Inaba they entrusted this task. A bilingual and bicultural person, Inaba was the director who hired and instructed the voice actors, all of whom spoke English. Unlike many games in Japan, which are written and voice acted in Japanese, and later translated and dubbed in English, the Silent Hill series was originally done in English. The Japanese publications would have subtitles with English voices. One of those voices was the enigmatic Michael G., the voice of the lead character of the first game, Harry Mason. For years, the identity of Michael G. was a mystery to fans, until very recently, when he was revealed to be Michael Gunn, a voice actor who was living in Japan at the time of the first game. His work on the game, as well as the other voice actors, went a long way to making the title stand out as something horrific and emotional, though of course there were stumbling blocks. The lines had to be recorded with a full one-second pause after them due to the limitations of the PlayStation. In addition, this script, while including haunting lines and emotional reveals, 
also had strange one-liners and weird inflections that didn't quite work as well. It may reflect the early stages of voice work, the struggles to translate the script, with Japanese team members trying to program and edit a language they didn't understand, as well as that of a team writing and creating their first game. It was a solid effort, with a few bumps in the road, but the overall effect was one of pure terror. In spite of all this hard work and progress, not everyone was convinced the game was going well. Toyama-san himself was nervous. He didn't think the game was scary. That all changed in 1998. When the game was premiered to the world at E3 in Atlanta, Georgia, it was the talk of the event. The graphics, the mood, the monsters. Suddenly, the team and Konami were far more confident in their project. On January 29, 1999, the game was released to North American audiences. Europe had to wait until February, and Japan until March. The game was a worldwide success. It sold enough copies to earn a Greatest Hits logo in America and a Gold Award in Europe. Reviewers across the board praised its graphics, its textures, and its ambiance. A decade after Sweet Home first invented the genre, Silent Hill reinvented it. Here was a game set in a horrific place, where the protagonist was not a buff police officer or hardened warrior, but a terrified father looking for his daughter. It was a first in so many ways, touching upon themes games rarely approached. Child abuse, corruption of power, cults and brainwashing, drug trafficking, all from a serious and respectful position. It was a beloved title overnight. That's not to say there were no critiques. Many people, in fact, found the dark, twisted plotline to be too confusing. Others criticized the difficult controls as an exercise in frustration. Still, it was undoubtedly an immediate classic, and overall was highly praised and beloved by fans. The game hadn't originally been planned as the start of a series, but given its major success, Konami knew they couldn't let the spark die. The team that made the first game was given reign over a new project, a sequel, and the small team of 20 grew to over 50 people. But not everyone returned to continue the series, most notably the game's director, Kiichiro Toyama. Toyama-san was young and inexperienced when directing Silent Hill. Before that, he'd worked on graphic design, and Silent Hill was the most control and the most responsibility he'd had. He felt that his team had been weakened by his inexperience, and that the flaws in the title could be thrown back onto his leadership. His confidence faltered. He left Konami and joined Sony Computer Entertainment in 1999. But he didn't go alone. Two Silent Hill team members, Naoko Sato and Isao Takahashi, went with him. The three of them worked together on a game called Yauko no Mariko, but it wasn't until Toyama-san found his confidence again that they truly collaborated. Naoko Sato was a lover of horror, but while making Silent Hill, she had concerns about the realism of the game. That is, she feared that as a Japanese team making a game in America, there would be aspects of the American small town feeling they just couldn't get right. It worried her, and led her to the realization that she truly wanted to create a Japanese-style horror game in a Japanese town. That desire meshed perfectly with a concept Teichiro Toyama wanted to bring to life. Along with Isao Takahashi, the three began working on creating another landmark horror game, Siren. Toyama-san was the director, focused on design and gameplay elements. Sato-san wrote the story and concept, and Takahashi-san was the art director. The game was a masterful experiment in horror, 
beloved as a cult classic, despite its infamous difficulty. It led to a sequel and a remaster in 2008. Still not done, the three continued working together on a new concept. Once again, Sato-san handled story concepts and writing, Toyama-san directed, and Takahashi-san was art director. Once again, they created a game based upon a sense of place, a game with a unique mechanic that would shake up the player, which in the West became known as Gravity Rush. Released on the Vita and then remastered on the PS4, the game was another cult hit and led to a sequel in 2018. Nearly all of the trio's games are focused upon a city, a town, or a small, remote location. There's an otherworldly feeling to them, that they are real and yet slightly unreal. In Gravity Rush, the player controls gravity. In Siren, the player can sightjack and see through others' eyes. Every game is a unique and fascinating experiment. Toyama-san continues working in video games today. He's a visionary, and apparently a funny drunk, who has stories of going out after work with co-workers and contemporaries, like the creators of Nier Automata, Clock Tower, Chrono Trigger, Twilight Syndrome, and his former co-workers on Team Silent, Yamaoka-san and Ito-san. While his Silent Hill days may be behind him, it was working on that title that he says opened his eyes to the delights of horror. Whether he returns to horror games, or simply continues to create imaginative, innovative titles in the future, I am sure the world will be delighted with whatever he, Sato-san, and Takahashi-san have in store. Back at Konami, the newly dubbed Team Silent was coming together to formulate a new idea for the future. First, they needed more employees to handle the larger workload. Some of these new hires included Kazuhide Nakazawa, who would work on character motion for Silent Hill 2, and Suguru Murakoshi, the drama director, who also worked on animation. Both of these men would go on to later direct a Silent Hill game. Another new hire was Jun Inoue, a designer in Silent Hill 2, who would have more influence on the fourth game of the series. The success of Silent Hill had proven the team was good at what they did. Takayoshi Sato won three awards for his work, including the Japanese Cultural Ministry Award and the Personal CEO Award at Konami. He'd proven himself, and as a reward, he was put in charge of character design and CGI in Silent Hill 2, as well as being given more influence over the overall story and design of the game. Masahiro Ito, who previously was a late hire brought on as a monster designer, was promoted to art director for two. And to replace Keiichiro Toyama as director was Masashi Suboyama, who was a background designer for the first game. And lastly, Akira Yamaoka returned, now acting as sound director for the game. These four would man the helm of Team Silent and go on to create the most influential horror game ever made. James, honey, did something happen to you? After we got separated in that long hallway? Are you confusing me with someone else? You were always so forgetful. Remember that time in the hotel? Maria? But what would the story be? Once again, it was from the world of written fiction that the team found their inspiration. This novel, however, wasn't from as far west. It was the Russian novel Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky. The story is that of a poor man driven to desperation, who plans to murder a woman and rob her to survive. The plan immediately goes awry, and the novel shows the main character's mental collapse as guilt and doubt plague him. The idea to use the novel came from Sato-san. 
While Hiroyuki Owaku wrote the story and script, Sato had great influence and wrote the dialogue for the female characters. The first game established the setting and the mythos of Silent Hill. Now, without having to create all that from the ground up, the team could focus on creating a strong story to set in that universe. The plot was the main focus, where in the first game, the environments and the technical challenges had to take a larger precedence. Silent Hill 2 wouldn't have as many technical difficulties, thanks to the advent of the PlayStation 2, the PlayStation's bigger, stronger, older brother. The platform could handle the technical challenges the game presented much better, allowing the team to create a larger and more realistic environment. The game would also have more voice acting than the original, and to make sure it was the best they could get, Takayoshi Sato went to America and worked on the game from there. He coordinated with Akihiro Imamura back home, the man who went from being a programmer in the first game to the producer of the second. The game would also be far darker than the first, and the first Silent Hill had already had content cut and edited. Monsters that looked like children had to be toned down for release, and in Silent Hill 2, they would find even more barriers. Ideas for weapons that chopped off monsters' heads in real time were dismissed. The famous scene where James is shown suffocating his wife originally had deeply upsetting audio of Mary as she fought back. This, too, was cut as being too graphic. There was also a great deal more to the grotesque vomiting in a certain scene, which was actually not cut on purpose. Part of it was lost during a computer crash, an event which Sato-san decided meant God wanted them to tone it down. The second game would have some technical upgrades, too. There were now multiple options for controlling the character, and the collision, which had been an issue in the first title, was vastly improved. They now had the ability to include 3D sound. The game's design would involve new areas of the town the players had never been to, including two apartment buildings. These apartments were actually based off of real buildings in the United States, a fact that surprised me, as I've always thought the apartments looked particularly Japanese. In fact, they're modeled after an employee's home in the California Bay Area that the Japanese team happened to visit on random chance. More than just the apartments were based on California, the team also took influence from the city streets of San Bruno. They took plenty of photos to use as inspiration, and in some cases, replicated the exact storefronts they found. The first and most influential location, however, was a nasty, decrepit bathroom. That would influence the first scene in the game, which also happened to be the first location the team created. The people in the game were designed by Takayoshi Sato. His designs may reflect his time living in America and studying the way American faces look, and perhaps the way they look in film and television. Multiple characters have similarities to existing people and properties. Maria's outfit is almost an exact replica of Christina Aguilera's from a VH1 exhibit. And Mary and Laura's look very similar to two characters from the film Con Air. The secret behind the masterful art of the second game is, in part, Sato-san's determination to be realistic in his designs. Maria, while being a beautiful woman, is not a typical oversexed or perfect model like the type we usually see in games. She has belly fat, wrinkles, imperfections. All of his characters are very grounded in reality. They look and move like people you might see on the street. Silent Hill has a very gritty realism to it, and this is in part Sato-san's influence. His designs, his hand-drawn facial animations that look eerily real and somehow deeply upsetting. But he wasn't the only artist on the team. Masahiro Ito was also hard at work on the monster side of things. Now, as art director, he had far more control than before, and he dove into the production with a particular mindset, that the monsters needed in some way to look human to be frightening. 
There is something off-putting about a creature that looks like us. For one, it invites the question of whether this thing was ever human, and if whatever happened to it could happen to us. It also creates sympathetic pain, the idea that this might happen to our limbs or our faces. It looks wrong. We expect to see something human and see something else entirely coming out of the dark shadows and eerie fog. The first monster of the game is the lying figure, a grotesque torso monster that spits acid. It was inspired by one of Ito-san's co-workers, who was walking down the hall with his hoodie on, his hands in his pockets. It gave the illusion of having no limbs. He also took influence from the motions of drunk people and young children, how they were unsteady and stumbling. In the first game, he would design off prompts given by Toyama-san, often leaving the man awed at his creativity. The child monster was his first design. In the second game, he would be the one to design the series' most iconic and famous creature. Pyramid Head is the perfect monster. Yet the design is so simple. A man's body and a triangle-shaped head. The concept came from the desire to have a monster that had no face. Something that appeared human without the most human element. It works so well because of the way it incorporates psychology with art design. Certain shapes are perceived by the eye in certain ways. Round, soft edges are friendly, but sharp edges are dangerous, unfriendly. Pyramid Head appears human, grotesque and dirty, but human. Yet the triangle head has no resemblance to a human head. It invites questions that people are still asking to this day, which Ito-san refuses to answer. Without a head, without eyes, it is hard to judge what a person or thing is doing, thinking, or feeling. It feels wrong to be missing such vital elements of humanity and leaves us unsettled. These aspects are what are at play in Pyramid Head's character and why he is such a long-lasting and beloved aspect of the series. This game would be a masterpiece, an exploration into sex and death or as Sato-san put it in one interview, Thanatos and Eros. Once again, the game debuted at E3, and once again, the audience was awed and fascinated by the horror title. While the Silent Hill booth at E3 might be, mm, slightly questionable, there was no doubt that the world was excited to learn more about the haunted town. The game didn't disappoint. It released in North America in September of 2001 on the PlayStation 2, and the updated version with the added Maria Born From A Wish episode released on Xbox in December. It sold 1 million copies in its first month, and even early on was earning praise as a standout in the video game market. Today, it's remembered as one of the best games of all time, if not the best horror game of all time. It deals with even more taboo issues than the first. Incest and rape, murder and euthanasia, mental illness and suicide. No game before had ever touched on these topics so much, or so deeply and respectfully, and few have since. It opened the door for video games to dive deeper into the darkness of the mind, and left an impact on a generation of game players. The first game had done well, and earned the team a fan following. The next shot it out of the ballpark, and brought them even more attention. Things were looking up. The question was, what to do now? There was no doubt there would be a third Silent Hill game. The question was, what would it be? Takayoshi Sato developed his own concept for it, but it never came to fruition. 
After some contract issues with Konami, he chose to depart on good terms. He went on to work for Electronic Arts, working on a cancelled Frogger game and Goldeneye Rogue Agent as art director. He never lost his unique style and passion, which shines in every piece he creates. In 2007, he moved on to Virtual Heroes, a company that works on serious games. It's a concept that Sato-san was passionate about, and even gave a presentation on the subject in Japan. Serious games are those created in an effort to teach. During his time at Virtual Heroes, Sato-san worked on titles that dealt with AIDS education, health and surgery simulations, even training videos for Hilton Hotels. One of his titles, a game called NASA Moonbase Alpha, is available on Steam. In 2009, he worked on a game called Fatal for Tale of Tales as a character designer and modeler. He lived and worked in the United States, specifically in the region of Raleigh, North Carolina, which, coincidentally, is where I live, until 2012, when he returned to Japan. This time, it was to work for Nintendo as a visual producer. He's worked on games like Paper Mario Color Splash, Dylan's Deadhead Breakers, Mario Tennis, and other classic Nintendo titles. His frustration with the game industry of the time, that most games were repetitive and similar, leaving art design to just creating guns, is what led him to consider trying serious games, and perhaps is why his return to traditional game design is at Nintendo, where games are often more experimental and less about bigger and bigger guns. Without Sato-san, Silent Hill as we know it wouldn't exist. Without his backbreaking work and inspirational dedication, we wouldn't have the beautifully crafted CGI, the hand-done facial animation, or the hauntingly realistic visions of humanity the game offers. His work had a hand in defining the first two games. It was his concept that gave birth to the complex plot of Silent Hill 2. Wherever he goes, and whatever he makes next, it is sure to be nothing less than a masterpiece. The director of Silent Hill 2, Masashi Tsuboyama, stepped down after the second game. To replace him, Kazuhide Nakazawa stepped to the plate. His first work with Konami was with motion and model design on Kensei Sacred Fist. The third Silent Hill was in his hands. The team had a conundrum. They'd done masterful work on their previous titles, but the second game had been almost completely divorced from the first. The fans wanted more content about the town, and answers to questions the first game had asked. The team felt they had to provide them. So, the concept was created, a game that would in some ways continue the story of the first title, not a direct sequel, but a continuation. Still, the team felt the games had gotten boring and repetitive. They needed something fresh, and they found it, in the form of a female protagonist, Heather. Horror games have long used female characters far more than other video games. Due to societal norms in both the East and West, it's generally considered more acceptable for a woman to show emotions like fear and anxiety than a man. It's also considered more likely the audience will care and feel sympathy for a female character. But unlike most horror games, who include female protagonists that spend most of the game screaming and flailing, Heather had that spark that Silent Hill has had since the beginning. Realism. She has freckles and moles. Her hair is dyed and faded at the roots. She looks tired. She has a personality and a mouth on her. Little comments and lines of dialogue give her depth and humanity few characters have. Her clothes are realistic, not overly revealing or ostentatious, but feminine and comfortable. It was in fact two women on the Silent Hill team who said Heather should be in a skirt, 
instead of in jeans, as Masahiro Ito-san had imagined. It is the perfect fit. Jeans are comfortable. You can run and work in them easily. A skirt is more restricting. It's often meant to impress and only worn in certain situations. Which is why Heather wearing a skirt is such a masterstroke of design. The events of Silent Hill 3 are clearly so wrong for this type of clothing. Because of it, she looks vulnerable and out of place. The girls had it right. The game would once again be on the PlayStation 2, and the team had a few new tricks up their sleeve, one of which was provided by Norihito Hatakeda, a programmer who had worked on the series since the first game. For this title, he designed a system that allowed for a kind of graphic effect to be present on the walls, floors, and other assets in layers, which could then move. It was a first for the industry and created a writhing alien look to the scenery that was particularly upsetting. Silent Hill 2 was about quiet building dread. Silent Hill 3 would be about in-your-face violence and sudden terror, and this would go a long way towards building that fear. In Silent Hill 2, part of the team worked in America to ensure the voice acting and translation were as good as they could be. That continued in Silent Hill 3, under the auspices of Jeremy Blaustein. He joined the team in two and was in charge of translating the story, and even had a hand in naming characters. It was his assistance that gave games two and three their far superior scripts and their haunting voice work. Is this a dream? It's gotta be. In 3, the name for the main character actually came from her voice actor, Heather Morris. Her role as Heather was her first in video games. During her interview for the part, the Silent Hill 3 team was taken by her name, and with her permission, changed the protagonist's name to Heather. The music for Silent Hill 3 would be a little different this time around. This game has a harder edge, a rock and roll vibe. It would also be the first game to have vocal tracks. It was something Yamaoka-san had wanted to do for some time, and he finally found the voice for it in Mary Elizabeth McGlynn. McGlynn is more than a vocalist. She's a voice actor, an ADR director, and singer-songwriter. Her voice is a mesmerizing, haunting tone that fits perfectly with Silent Hill's mood. You may have heard her elsewhere first, perhaps as the voice of the Major in Ghost in the Shell. She's also worked in Final Fantasy, Devil May Cry, Dot Hack, Resident Evil, and Xenoblade Chronicles. Yamaoka-san has a specific way he goes about making his music. It's not all about melody to him. In fact, he has many songs which have none to speak of. It's about emotion and feeling. For this game, Yamaoka wanted to create a soundtrack that was an experience that could be listened to without the game. Not just a CD with the songs from the game listed in order, but an album with spirit and artistry. This CD would have multiple vocal tracks, songs and spoken poetry, as well as arrangements from the game. And because Yamaoka was also involved in the music for Beat Mania and Dance Dance Revolution, the track You're Not Here was able to feature in one of the games with a music video that included Heather. The CD would be released alongside the game. When creating music for Silent Hill, Yamaoka-san doesn't compose. He records himself playing and works from there. It usually takes him a few days to make a track, maybe three months to make the entire soundtrack, but he doesn't make his music divorced from the game. He's been heavily involved in all aspects of creation from the beginning and creates his music alongside the game's development. In fact, for Silent Hill 3, Yamaoka-san would be even more involved. Besides the music, he was given the role of producer, a role he considers much harder, but he rose to the challenge. Like the previous games, there were aspects of Silent Hill 3 that didn't make it to publication. There were ideas for including limb amputation. Whether that's cutting off the limbs of enemies or a character's injury is unclear but it wasn't approved. The game would also have a few firsts, including the first automatic weapons in Silent Hill. 
but it would also be missing something. The beautiful CGI cutscenes of the past were no longer present. On the one hand, those haunting scenes left a powerful impact. On the other, the game has a more grounded, immersive feeling, since the cutscenes and gameplay are not differentiated. For the first time, the game would release in Europe first in May of 2003. Once again, the game would do very well and receive critical acclaim. It sold 300,000 copies by November and topped the charts in Japan. Yet critics were disappointed by the lack of innovation, the similarities between 2 and 3, the fact that little had changed in the small town of Silent Hill. Little did they know that before Silent Hill 3 even finished publication, Part of the team broke off and began working on a new Silent Hill title that would be the innovation they were looking for. For Silent Hill 4, Masahiro Ito would receive a special thanks in the credits, but he didn't seem to have actually worked on the project. For him, the story of Silent Hill would end with the third game. But he hardly stopped working on the series. Alongside Hiroyuki Owaku, scenario and script writer, he would create the comics Cage of Cradle and Double Under Dusk, released only in Japan on the cell phone. From there, he'd continue working on art for other games and companies, including the Metal Gear Solid series, card games like Sengoku Shi Tyson and Kiba, and a Russian work called Acid Buffer Zone. In 2012, his art would premiere at an exhibition in Paris at the Galerie Chappé. He's done work for Dark Summoner, a free phone game, and was the monster designer for the games Night Cry and Metal Gear Survive. He's still involved in Silent Hill from time to time. The company that makes the Silent Hill statuettes brought him on to design the art for the boxes. He did covers for Silent Hill comics, art for the Japanese novelizations, and some covers for the later games, including the cover of Silent Hill Downpour in Japan. It's clear that his work on Silent Hill has had a great effect on him. His Twitter icon is Pyramid Head to this day. He often draws his monsters from the series and is known to answer questions from fans online. But he's not pining for the past. He's working on new projects and hopes to continue to innovate in the horror genre. He may appreciate Silent Hill and what it was to him, but he's ready to make new, even more horrifying works. Without him, the truly disgusting, terrifying creatures of Silent Hill just wouldn't be the same, and we wouldn't have the most famous, horrific creature to ever step foot in a video game. Before Silent Hill 3 was finished, Silent Hill 4 was already in the works. Some sources say they began at the same time, others that 4 was started when 3 was closer to being finished. Either way, the team was divided between the projects, with about 40 people working on 3, and a smaller team on 4. 3 had been made in part to satisfy fans, 4 would be made to satisfy the team. They wanted to do something new, something fresh. At this point, the longest team members had been around for about six years. They were ready to start experimenting again. The director would be Suguru Murakoshi. Art director would be Masashi Suboyama, the director of the second game. And he would work on monster design as well, alongside Jun Inoue. Character design was in part done by Naomi Hara and Shingo Yuri. Yuri-san had been a character modeler in 3 and a designer in 2. Hara-san was a new team member. Akira Yamaoka returned for sound director. The goal was to create something fresh, and the idea centered upon a concept, Room 302. There have been rumors for years that the game was originally not meant to be a Silent Hill title, and there's sources that go either way. The confusion may be that the game was only considered a separate property for a very short time. Before long, Room 302 became Silent Hill 4, The Room. The concept, turning your home, your place of safety, into something terrifying. The idea would lead to multiple changes in design and programming. Instead of exploring a town, 
the player was trapped in an apartment and could only explore certain places at certain times. It led to a more linear experience. While in the apartment, the player explored with a first-person camera to reinforce the idea that this was you, the player, trapped in this room. This decision also meant that the choice to enter the other world would be on the player, unlike in previous games where the nightmares often began outside of their control. This time, the player would have to choose to enter Hell, an interesting twist on an old concept. The game would have unkillable enemies, restricted save points, less puzzles, less bosses, and more types of weapons. To further the idea that the player was the main character, the team decided not to give their protagonist too much development, in order to make the player feel that it was them in this situation. So their hero, Henry Townshend, became a reserved and rather sedated character, who was designed by Naomi Hara. It was a controversial move, with many fans still to this day complaining about his lack of personality, without seeing the subtlety at work underneath. They also wanted the game to have a more Japanese feel. The first three games were all very American, because the series had begun as a semi-adaptation of an American concept. This time, the horror would be very much inspired by Japan. The use of ghosts as enemies was inspired by the cultural horror stories that haunt this country, and the team at times worried it wouldn't be as well accepted outside their homeland, but they pushed forward with the concept. Some of their design choices, however, weren't by choice. The team was much smaller than previous titles, and the decision to split them between three and four had consequences. There were no bosses in the game because there weren't enough people to create them. Possibly there may be fewer puzzles for the same reason. The team had less to work with, but they still worked hard to create the most horrifying scenario they could imagine. The game's main enemy would be, in a sense, a human being. A special human, but human nonetheless. And this concept came from a small piece of lore in the second game. Walter Sullivan. He would be a terrifying enemy, a serial killer, who behaved with a strange, unsettling kindness and politeness. This was a conscious decision, used to make Walter an even more upsetting character, who could be tearing you to pieces while gently smiling. He is a mystery, someone who is difficult to understand, which is why his eyes often won't meet the camera. In the third game, the team got rid of CGI cutscenes to create a more immersive experience. They'd take it a step further in 4, creating what they called the playable cutscene. Certain conversations and events would happen in-game in areas where the player could still walk and explore. A character might be talking in one corner of the room, but the player wouldn't be stuck standing still. They could still explore, or even leave, and the speaker's voice would fade into the background. It gave the game a startling sense of realism. In other games, the player was exploring a town, trying to avoid things they couldn't see. This time, the things in the fog would be hunting you. This was a game focused on the fear of being chased and purposefully targeted by the mad killer Walter Sullivan. There was content left on the cutting room floor. Interestingly enough, though, the design that's discussed as being cut is very similar to a creature that's in the game. There was a two-headed monster that was considered too upsetting, but 4 has the twin victim, which is a two-headed monster. Does this mean the creature was even more grotesque originally? Or was there another monster like it? It's notable that this creature is the only one who represents a victim in the game. All the other victims are ghosts. Perhaps the original twin victim was a two-headed ghost that was considered too much for the title. The game was once again at E3 in 2004, with a model of the room the player would be trapped in. It was published in Japan first, perhaps to respect the fact that this would be a Silent Hill truly meant for Japanese audiences. It once again was critically well received as a terrifying experience. It was nominated for awards and sold well across the globe. It was with Silent Hill fans that the game struggled to find its footing. The team was disappointed to find that their own fan base was the most displeased with their game. While the feeling wasn't universal, 
I myself consider 4 my favorite of the original games, there was enough backlash to make the team reconsider some of their decisions. The increased amount of combat, the fewer puzzles and other staples of the series were some of the complaints, as well as a wave of backlash against the supposedly boring Henry. Much like Japanese horror in general, Silent Hill 4 was far more subtle than previous titles, and not everyone liked it. Again, some of the changes weren't in the hands of the developers, but others were, and as much as fans were turned off by the innovations, it was the right step. 3 had been seen as too similar, lacking innovation. 4 was a game brave enough to experiment. It was ahead of its time. The first-person camera and the themes of being hunted by unkillable enemies, all this and more would be found in later games like Amnesia and Outlast. In fact, the ever-popular PT demo that came in later years is clearly more influenced by 4 than any other Silent Hill. The team was ready to start again, with more ideas to experiment with, more concepts to create, but they would never get the chance. After Silent Hill 4, Team Silent was disbanded. Rumors as to how and why have been running wild since. The one artist who worked on a Silent Hill game claims it was Konami's decision, that they had lost confidence in the developers as a team. Whatever the case, Silent Hill 4 would be the last title to be made by the original team. It wasn't the end of Silent Hill, and it wasn't the end of Akira Yamaoka's work on the series. Of the original team, Yamaoka-san would be the one to return for Silent Hill 5 and its subsequent games. The series would continue to have mixed success, with both critical reviewers and the fanbase divided in feelings on the succeeding titles. The first four games would soon be held to near-divine status after the loss of Team Silent. Akira Yamaoka is a fascinating man. He listens to all kinds of music, loves Depeche Mode, Massive Attack, Visage, Metallica, and Korn, who ironically would go on to later make a Silent Hill song. He says he takes the most inspiration from Trent Reznor, a musician, singer, songwriter, and composer. He likes Dutch trance and industrial sound, but rarely has anything nice to say about most video game music. The few composers he seems to like are Nobuo Imatsu, the composer for the Final Fantasy series, who he says is a friend, and Woody Jackson, the composer of the Red Dead Redemption series. They work together on a charity album, raising money for Japan after a serious natural disaster. Most video game soundtracks, he says, are rather boring and too formulaic in design. He left Konami to work at Grasshopper Manufacture in 2010, where he worked with Resident Evil director Shinji Mikami on the game Shadows of the Damned. Yamaoka-san professed he greatly enjoyed Resident Evil 4. He also worked on Lollipop Chainsaw, Let It Die, Contra Shattered Soldier, Killer is Dead, and others. He continued making the soundtracks for the Silent Hill games until Silent Hill Downpour in 2012. With his departure, the last original member of Team Silent would leave Silent Hill behind. But he never stopped working, publishing his own albums, performing in concerts, developing music for games. He's working on a film called The Sandman with Dario Argento, one of his favorite directors. Like Masahiro Ito, his career has long been defined by Silent Hill, and he isn't upset by it. Theme of Laura is one of his favorite tracks from the series, and he enjoys playing songs for fans. But creating new and original content is the driving force behind his work. The newest game in the series was going to be called Silent Hills. Given the team making it and the PT demo that was released to announce it, the game looked too good to be true. And it was. Konami cancelled the title among a flurry of controversy, and the only new content to come from the Silent Hill concept was a pachinko gambling machine in Japan. While cancelled games are a dime a dozen in the gaming industry, this one in particular may herald a greater end. 
the end of the Silent Hill series. There have been no announcements, no further details on the series and its future, and given the state of things at Konami, there's likely not going to be for some time, if ever. The series is, for the most part, likely over. Quite honestly, it is a tragedy, not only from the point of view of a fan, but as someone who loves video games. The industry needs Silent Hill. The games have been pushing the envelope from the beginning, showing the world what a video game can be, what it can mean, and how it can touch people. No other game series has ever dived so deeply into the darkest parts of what it means to be human. Those games that try often cite Silent Hill as their inspiration. The concept of the town is endlessly creative. There is no limit to what can be done with a haunted, mysterious town that can see into your heart and knows you better than you know yourself. While Team Silent should rightly move forward with their lives and careers, Konami itself shouldn't leave this massively important title on the shelf. Hopefully with time, we will see the fog of controversy fade away and a new Silent Hill game on the horizon. Until that time, I will continue enjoying the previous titles we've been gifted with, especially those made by the truly visionary, masterful people who were part of Team Silent. Can't say goodbye Every time 